Um, so if I can back up a little bit, uh, just, 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 just give an overview of uh, geometric frustration. Um, as we know that, uh, well know uh, for, for the field of quantum spin liquids, there are various types of uh, crystal lattices uh, where the geometry gives rise to this uh, magnetic frustration and that prevents the ordering of moments down to zero temperature and, and therefore give rise to these quantum spin liquids, right? And, and, and more recently, uh, at least to experimentalists, uh, it became more uh, well known that if you think about this uh, for the fermionic models, uh, the same kind of frustration translates to this uh, destructive interference of the electronic wave function uh, such that you can have um, a localized uh, uh, electronic wave function within in, in space, which therefore becomes these completely de delocalized flat bands in, in momentum space. And if you consider uh, the inclusion of spin over coupling, that would open up some gaps and this becomes a topological uh, flat band. Okay, so um, moreover, this is of course uh, not limited just to the Kagomi lattice, which is the most widely studied one, uh, but more general, as, as you also heard from Andre's talk yesterday, this is more general to any kind of line graph lattice. And the Kagomi lattice is a line graph lattice of the honeycomb lattice. You can see that underneath. And so any type of line graph lattice should have this kind of uh, physics. So, um, and this is uh, the catalog of the various types of lattices people have uh, looked into and, and found evidence for these topological flat bands. And this includes Kagomi lattice, in 3D particle lattice, Lie lattice, bipartite lattice, lattice, and so on and so forth, where you can, at least from the uh, non-interacting limit from DFT, you can already see evidence of these uh, of these topological flat bands. And, and uh, however, uh, from, from DFT perspective, the location of the flat bands from this non-interacting limit is, of course, can be anywhere in energy. So since I'm gonna focus on the 3D power core lattice, um, I wanna introduce a little bit more uh, specifically what is expected theoretically of the power core lattice. So, um, 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 so here, a particle lattice consists of corner shear and tetrahedra, uh, instead of the, which is really a 3D analog of the 2D Kagomi lattice. And uh, given all the all the promises of the Kagomi lattice, we know that when we look at bulk materials, uh, there's always interlayer coupling, which uh, somewhat disrupts this destructive interference effect. So, to really fulfill the potential of this kind of destructive interference. Um, we need a way to remove this interlayer coupling, which you can either do by going to the monolayer regime or uh, going to 3D, where there's already inherent and natural uh, destructive interference uh, um, uh, along all three directions. And that, that's why we're interested in to study these particle lattices. So if we take a closer look um, in the 3D particle lattice, how do we understand the, uh, the origin of the flat bands? If you look at the crystal structure, and this was already mentioned a couple of times over the week, um, there's a way you can cut through the pyrochor lattice uh, along the one on one direction where you can expose uh, what looks like a Kagomi plane. And more importantly, if you calculate the, uh, the one year amplitude uh, for these four sites, the one site which is not contained uh, within these planes actually has identically zero amplitude, which means that effectively we can consider the 3D pyrochor lattice as decoupled, completely coupled uh, Kagomi planes. This is only considering near sleeper hopping, of course. So the result is that uh, this kind of view would give rise to two uh, degenerate flat bands in addition to two dispersed disperse bands. So this is a situation when uh, we do not consider spin over coupling and when we consider spin over coupling, oh, sorry, before we go there, um, in addition, there's also a triple degeneracy point here um, formed by the two flat bands and also quadratic touching with this dispersive bands. And in addition, there is this uh, direct nodal uh, line between the X and W points of the brain zone. Now we can put an SOC. So when we consider spin over coupling, uh, depending on the sign of the spin over coupling, we can either gap uh, it between the flat bands and the dispersive bands uh, into this form or uh, have this gap happening between the flat bands. And in that case, you have this kind of quadratic band touching still. What happens to the direct nodal line? Well, the spin over coupling gaps out uh, 
this entire line except exactly at the X point of the brain on zone there. I think Sarah also mentioned this uh, briefly as well. And the reason that all the band dispersions that crosses X remains gapless is because of the inherent uh, non-somorphic symmetry of the pyrocoil lattice. And just to see that again, the way we can see this is if you think about, uh, easy way to think, think about it, to see this is that if we consider the site uh, in the middle of each of these heterohedron and the pyrocoil lattice, that forms this diamond lattice. And you can see, you've already seen this in, in Sarah's talk. And associated with the diamond lattice is this uh, screw axis, which uh, is a combination of a four-fold in-plane rotation symmetry and also a quarter translation along the C-axis. And that, that's, the, that's the screw axis. And uh, it was already predicted uh, more than a decade ago that, that associated with the diamond lattice, you would have uh, this uh, gapless uh, 3D Dirac cone as, as, uh, protected by the symmetry. Great, so that is the, what we expect theoretically. So there are two things we should look for. Uh, that's associate guaranteed for any pyrochlor. Uh, one, one is a three-dimensional, one is the three-dimensional flat bands, and the other one are these Dirac cones all, 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 always uh, uh, pinned at the X point. So therefore, we wanted to see experimentally, can we realize these predictions uh, in real materials? And so um, one of the first things that, that came into our hands, I guess, uh, is this compound, um, serum resinium 2 and it's been around for a long time. It was discovered by Matthias uh, when he was searching for a ferromagnetic superconductor and, uh, and uh, across this entire series, the serum resinium 2 it's a superconductor, which I think is on the verge of becoming ferromagnetic, but not yet. Uh, it has a TC of about 5 Kelvin. Um, structurally, uh, there are two sublattices. Uh, the cerium lattice forms a diamond lattice, but the ruthenium sublattice is the pyrochlor. And um, so the question arises, what kind of physics do we expect out of these two sublattices? And one of the things uh, that we can do first is look at the uh, help of DFT. And from DFT calculations, um, what they see is that this, the serum F states are mostly concentrated above the Fermi level. And from the Fermi level down, it's mostly dominated by the Rossini D overtones, which suggests, at least suggested that perhaps this uh, material, uh, we can indeed find evidence of the pyrochlor lattice at play near the Fermi level. So we, we went ahead and, and started to look at this. And uh, I know the audience is mostly theorists and you may not appreciate this, but this is actually experimentally pretty difficult to do uh, because the, these crystals are inherently 3D and, and for photo emission, they are very difficult to cleave and, 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 uh, and, uh, and my, my post, I guess, I guess tried many, many tens and maybe hundreds of crystals and eventually was able to um, find uh, surfaces where he can actually uh, observe dispersive band dispersions that are intrinsic to the crystal. Um, so the way we can think about this is uh, here he managed to observe uh, to cleave a crystal uh, that exposes the one on one plane. And uh, you can see the symmetry of the Fermi surface matches that what's expected of this, this, this cut of the Brion zone. So let's look, the first thing we want to do is check uh, how does EFT do? Um, so if we look in the large energy range, which is shown here, um, the dispersions, you can see that actually the match is not bad. Uh, uh, farther away from the Fermi level, we have a dispersive the whole bands. There's some flattish bands here. And this is a renormalization factor of, after a renormalization factor about 1.2 on the DFT. Um, and so then we wanted to zoom in uh, to close the Fermi level. And indeed, we can see, I hope you can see from the images, the color images, there are these uh, flattish bands here, which we call flat bands one and two. And if we don't, we don't really like uh, color images, uh, if we take EDCs here, you can follow the track, the peaks, and that would, that would give rise to the two, uh, two flat bands. And so here, uh, these measurements are taken uh, in the plane uh, colored by pink. So this is in the one-on-one -on -one plane. So the next thing we want to do is check out of plane uh, because they should be three-dimensional. So the way we do this is by uh, varying the photon energy, uh, which we do our photo emission measurements. And, uh, and if you see this, this is a stack of uh, the cuts uh, taken by varying the photon energy. And what we're doing is we're traversing the cuts from this corner of the brain zone to the middle of the brain zone. So effectively, this maps out half of the brain zone. 
And I hope you can see that the two, two, two uh, uh, very flat, relatively, relatively flat bands are persisting over uh, half of the brain zone by symmetry over pretty much almost the whole brain zone. So here we can see that these flat bands are indeed uh, three dimensional. Um, and uh, furthermore, we can extract a bandwidth of these and we can do that by uh, uh, making a virtual cut out of this, out of the data, the whole cube of data set and tracking and fitting the, the peak here to gain a, a bandwidth, which uh, for this uh, out of point direction is less than 30 millivolts, which is actually pretty small. And just for reference, for some of the best uh, Kagomi systems, the flat band, uh, bandwidth is on order of maybe a couple hundred millivolts. So this is very encouraging to us uh, that we have identified these flat bands in pyrochlor lattice. Uh, but as you also know, the, you, you can see that this is a serum compound. So the question always arises, is this flat band really due to the pyrophore lattice, which uh, we think it is, or is it really uh, due to the uh, F, F states? And we have done very systematic uh, checks uh, for this possibility. And I just want to show you one evidence why it, it does not look like it's of the F origin. And the reason is that for all the serum compounds out there, uh, we know that there is a residence effect. Um, around 122 EV and where you can see, for example, in the serum uh, uh, resonant 2 silicon 2, when you're on this resonance, you can have, have a big enhancement of this, uh, of this uh, uh, F, F state and then off, off the resonance. And for serum 2, there is no uh, resonance, resonance effect as far as we can see. And we have done systematic uh, photon energy dependence and we can see that the intensity is not peak at the resonance. Uh, so this suggests that what we see is not likely to be at least not dominantly F states. And there we have other evidence that we, well, I won't go into too much detail for. For example, we do see very sharp flat bands with the helium lamp at 21.2 EV. And for those working, I guess, uh, in the heavy fermion community is know that you don't pick up F states at this photon energy. We also ch check for uh, bulk sensitive self extra regime, which where we can also see this. So we can also exclude that this flat band comes from any kind of uh, extrinsic surface origin. So we've done uh, all these checks to just demonstrate that we think that this flat band is really coming from this quantum interference effect of the pyrochore sublattice of the ruthenium. Okay, so the second thing that we want to search for are these three-dimensional direct points. And uh, as seen from this uh, uh, um, tight binding calculation already, they have, they have the pin at the X point. And that is indeed seeing the DFT calculations, all the bands, uh, the, all the band crossings at the X point are three dimensional direct points that remain gapless. And this is with the incorporation of spin over coupling. And from photo emission, we can see there are lots of band crossings and, uh, and they in principle should all be crossings, but we can only resolve the ones that are farther away from the Fermi level. And from these, we can see from both MDCs and EDCs that there is indeed a crossing uh, seen here at the X point, which, uh, then also checks in that this uh, pyrochore lattice indeed produces the right monosomorphic symmetry produced at direct points. Okay, so as a brief summary at this point, we should compare side by side uh, our, what are the key uh, signatures in the band dispersions uh, for Kagomi and pyrochore. So here in the pyrochore, we know the flat bands are flat in three dimensions and also the direct points remain gapless. And that's uh, in contrast to, to the Kagomi system where you can, they are gapped out by slumber coupling. So in the Kagomi system, we know that the, the so saddle points are Van Hoff singularities, at least in the theoretical 2D model. Uh, and, but in the pyrochore lattice, uh, they, they remain saddle points. They don't have uh, divergent density states. And in addition, there's also uh, guaranteed quadratic band touching associated with the pyrochore lattice at the gamma point. Okay, so that's the first part. And, uh, and uh, we have used the system to demonstrate that Indeed, we can find, uh, we, can, we can think about the pyrochore lattice as, as a good host for these topological flat bands. And next, I wanna show you this even more interesting system, which uh, we've st been studying in the recent uh, couple months, um, where there's even more interesting uh, things regarding correlations. Um, so copper, vanadium, two, sulfur, four. There are three, uh, three, uh, three atom atoms, atomic, the copper, vanadium, sulfur, and it is the vanadium site that forms the pyrochore sublattice here. If we do the electron counting and also uh, from a previous uh, 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 extra photo emission uh, measurements, uh, it was figured out that the 
the copper sits in the middle of this uh, tetrahedron. Um, so therefore, the copper, uh, if you do the measurements, you can see that it's, it's, it's basically a full, fully filled uh, 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 shell. And therefore, the band dispersion is actually farther away from the, 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 the band near the Fermi level are, are not most, are, are, there's very little copper uh, uh, content there. The, the vanadium, on the other hand, has a partially uh, filled T2G orbitals. And that therefore, the, they're the dominant uh, uh, orbitals that contribute to the band dispersion near the Fermi level. So from DFT, uh, here's what we see. We see most of the content is indeed coming from uh, vanadium. Furthermore, you can see that right, all of this is uh, vanadium T2G. These are the unfilled e, uh, EG orbitals up there. And then the copper and sulfur are further out, like a uh, one EG or, or more. So this is encouraging because this addresses that, it, it, again, in the system, we, there's a hope that we can uh, see some manifestation of the pyrochrome lattice associated with the vanadium sublattice. But here, from the DFT, just, rem, uh, just we notice that these bands actually sit uh, about half an EB above the Fermi level. When we actually did the experiment, this is what we see. Um, so in the large range, about you know, half EV or out or below, the dispersions that we measure actually fit very well with the DFT calculations. And these are mostly the copper and sulfur bands. But the DFT is quite off in the region near the Fermi level. You can see that the dispersive bands, they're, they're just not match very well. So this suggests that perhaps we're missing some correlation effects uh, not considered for the vanadium T2G bands. Oops, OK. And uh, furthermore, if we zoom really close to the Fermi level, we do see very clearly this sharp uh, flat band, which is basically hugging the Fermi level. And you can see that both from the images, this blue thing, that's the highest intensity for both uh, color maps. And you can see the high peaks across the entirety of this cut here and here, and both in plane and also on the out of plane direction, we can see the flat band persists to a really large region of the, of the triangle. So now we need to resolve this, this, this inconsistency that DFT predicts the flat bands actually exist half EV above the Fermi level. And this reminded us of the, uh, the previous work we did with the orbital uh, selective correlations in the iron-based superconductors, and which suggests that you can have uh, maybe uh, selectively more uh, localization in, in certain orbitals. In this case, it would be the T2G uh, of the vanadium. So in collaboration with Sunel's group, uh, they did a slave spin calculation uh, where they added correlation effects to the vanadium T2G orbitals. And you can see this is a tight binding fit to the DFT calculations um, for the 12 uh, orbital, which is consists of the four uh, atoms with the three T2G orbitals. And you can see that in the near EF region, the fit is, the, the match, the data is not, is quite off. But if you add the correlations here, um, you can see you can, there's the overall randomization effects that brings the flatbeds down and that's manifested in the density of states. And also, not only the flat band, but we can choose a uh, geometry where we, do, we can do measurements where the intensity from the flat band is, is, is weak, so we can actually see some of these first bands. So we can see here is these dots are the fitted band positions for this whole like, alpha band and the uh, electron beta band and the corresponding bands in the, in the calculation. And you can see, obviously, that in this case, when we add the correlation effects, not only is the flat band improved, but the match with the dispersive, dispersive bands associated with the vanadium T2G are also improved, and they're, they're shifted towards the Fermi level with the overall normalization factor uh, effect as well. So again, this is really reminiscent of this, uh, the overall sort of correlation effects we've seen in the iron-based superconductors. OK, so um, given that we have such a high density states observed experimentally uh, near the Fermi level, the question arises, can this have any manifestation in the transport behaviors? And indeed, there is. Uh, so this is the transport measurements done by our collaborator, Chung Hao Chu's group at University of Washington. And from the resistivity measured as a function of temperature, um, we can do a fitting. It, it does uh, obey a parallel uh, behavior. And if we extract the exponent as a function of temperature, you can see there's a large range, about a decade from 2K below temperature 2K to 20K. Um, it has an exponent of about 1.6 which suggests that this deviates from, uh, from the liquid behavior. Just to make that uh, more uh, confirm this, we have plotted the role, the resistivity uh, uh, against TP to 1.6, and you can see the linearity in this fit. And in comparison, if you plot this for uh, against T squared, you can see the fit is not as good. So therefore, it seems like this is a robust uh, observation of the non-fermi liquid transport. 
And besides that, we can also measure the sum of our coefficient from specific heat. And from this, we can extract uh, that the sum of our coefficient experimentally observed is about a factor of six larger than that of a DFT. And this is also consistent with this uh, additional uh, remediation effect that brings some of flat bands, right? And with these two uh, 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 measurements, uh, we, can, we can attempt to plot uh, this uh, compound onto this uh, Katawaki woods ratio plot. And it turns out that this material, uh, copper vanadium sulfur 4, uh, has the same value along in the, on the same line as, as, as the other heavy fermions. Um, as for kicks, we also plotted uh, lithium-2 here. And then this lithium vanadium 2 oxygen two, uh, 4 is isostructural. And you can see that these three pyrochrol lattices all fall on this uh, heavy fermion line separated from the transition metals. Right? So what we think we're seeing here is really the combined uh, effect of the electron-electron correlations of the partially filled T2G orbitals of the vanadium together with the quantum interference effect uh, uh, associated with a pyrochrome lattice that induces the, the, the flat bands. The combination of these two effects, therefore, makes these, this system, which is purely a D electron system, uh, to have behaviors that may mimic that of heavy fermions. So to take this analogy further, maybe um, we can think about these flat bands, just um, something like re reminiscent of localized molecular orbitals, that, that, and then the dispersive bands, as the itinerary electrons, and this is analogous to the Connell lattice of F versus the SPD uh, conduction, uh, uh, itinerary electrons, as well as the orbital side of MOT stuff uh, from the ion trichogenides. Um, so um, this seems to be at least our understanding of how, uh, how correlation effects are, is enhanced in this system. Um, so uh, the only difference is that in this compound, these flat bands are topological in nature. And uh, this, uh, in order to, to make this work, uh, there's, of course, we heard about uh, numerous efforts in the recent uh, days where how to, how to actually make the map this onto the, onto the contour lattice from this, uh, map these topological non-local flat bands to, top lot, to the contour lattice problem. Given this analogy, um, then we can uh, think about this maybe in the, in the context of other known flat band system or condo system. And here, just you know, flash two things. This is, I guess, Linda talked about this on Monday uh, in, in, in the flat band Kagomi system. You can see also non formulaic behavior. And more interestingly, uh, Chimel reminded me of this, uh, this work um, where, where they look at this the assorted Kagomi lattice, uh, cm palladium aluminum, and where uh, this is the condo system, and where they can find, uh, this is the phase diagram uh, of pressure versus field, they can find a pocket in the phase diagram where the color here is the, is the exponent of the resistivity, where there's a pocket of non-forming liquid uh, uh, transport. And they can understand this uh, in, in this uh, larger uh, phase diagram of the, associated with the, with the condo lattice, um, where there's, uh, this is a um, non-ordered uh, spin, spin liquid phase, uh, where you can also expect to see this kind of uh, um, deviation from T-squared uh, power law and the resistivity. So in that sense, perhaps uh, our system is actually analogous to this kind of uh, mapping to this kind of lattice system. Um, I think that's about it. This is just a, a summary slide. Um, so here, I just want to really emphasize that what the non formal liquid behavior we see here is really, uh, it needs both components. Uh, it needs, first of all, this uh, quantum destructive interference to produce these uh, uh, flat beds to begin with. But they're, when they're produced, they're actually quite far from the formula to do anything. Then, in addition, we need the electron electron correlations, which then, this is actually, it's actually moderate electron correlations in the system. But even that moderate electron correlations can bring these, uh, pin these flat bands or bring them to approach the Fermi level such that we can see this manifestation or amplified correlation effects, which needs both, both uh, moderate correlations and this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, quantum interference flat bands to begin with. And it's really these two effects working together to give rise to this type of interesting uh, non formal liquid behavior. So uh, with that, I guess I will thank all of uh, our uh, team of uh, people who, who work on this. And this is my, my postdoc, Tiamui Huang, who did both the RPEDs on both systems. And uh, this would not have been possible without uh, our theory collaboration with Tiamui's group, who uh, in particular, Chenden, Chenden and Chimel were the ones that uh, brought our attention to, to the pyrochrome lattice 
and they is the one that did a lot of the calculations to make this uh, happen. And our samples are, are from uh, IOP and also Peng Chung's group uh, at Rice, one of the ICE group, and uh, also uh, Transform Measurement Collaboration with Hao Chu's group and also Paul Chu's group at UC Houston. So thank you very much. <laughs>
subset of this. So you, you, what you do is to make the sum of the bands, the D bands, to be forced to be very close to half filling, which is what's happening, um, and, and reshuffling the occupancy. So question to the first compound. Uh, what was the rationale to, if you search for flat band driven by uh, line graph uh, arguments, why do you choose a serum compound? We Why not do lanthanum, ruthenium-2, or something? We, we didn't choose it. It was, it was given to us. So we start off with this comment. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're right. So we're trying to convince, you know, if there, we haven't found anybody who has the... You're right. So if we can avoid the serum, that would be, that would be better. Yeah, because I yeah. think in the DFT, as, as you showed it very quickly only, I think there's a serum band according to DFT. It's just above the Fermi energy, right? right? right and right, of course, right. DFT never gets that right, so it could very well be just a little bit below. So I think that's that's if we had a chance, yeah. But it, that was the compound that was <laughs> that was available. So we 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 I see. We, okay. we, we Fine. just experimental, yeah. But okay. if anybody has lanthanum version, we're very happy. <laughs> Maybe Selka yeah. has it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, any other questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the orbital selective uh, uh, picture, right? So, so do you have any insight of uh, what kinds of material you should start to think about this and in what kind of material you don't have to think about this? DFT is, is just fine. Yeah. So I, I guess in the case of the iron tricotton, I first, I'm, so in that case, the XY orbital uh, it starts off with a smaller bandwidth, just from a DFT perspective, mm -hmm. and it is also somewhat close to uh, half filling or, or some some sort of partially filled. So that, and it also because of the crystal field splitting, the XY orbital is, is isolated from the XYZ. So in that sense, it's more likely to to go into the regime where you have more localization of XY than the other XYZ orbitals. Um, if you have a tricogenite or oxide or so you should start to think about this. Yeah. Like a right. name a compound? Or? Oh yeah, I, I was just, just maybe my, my question was, uh, you know, for the first compound, DFT just works, right? Yeah. And a, for, for the serum ruthenium-2, uh -huh. uh, I guess the DFT was a, was a Oh, describes the, the band dispersion very well. And uh, for the copper vanadium yeah. sulfide, uh, somehow you have to think about the orbital selective uh, right. So the, so the, band. Right, <laughs> for the copper, uh, so the one, two, four, the copper is mostly almost all filled. So in that way, those that part of the band is actually pretty well described by DFT. The, v, V2, the, the vanadium T2G bands are the partially filled orbitals at the Fermi level. Okay, so partially filled yeah. orbitals. Yeah. And, uh, okay, okay. I mean, in general, if interaction is stronger, which the second compound it does uh, have it compared to the first one, then any interaction effect would be amplified, including the orbital selective aspect. Uh, any other? Questions, comments? If not, let's thank uh, me and all the speakers of the session.